Good morning, and <clears throat> thank you very much for this uh, very kind introduction and um, for inviting me to talk here. Um, so it's been a really um, nice introduction by Ingo as well. This is a perfect um, introduction for what I'm going to talk about. And I think my presentation will be in two parts. So the first part, I will really focus on some efforts of how we might be able to diagnose um, Dravé syndrome earlier than what we currently can, uh, and really think about how um, we find validated methods, how to do that. And in the second part of the talk, I talk about something completely different and that uh, Ingo alluded to, which are the gain-of-function phenotypes, which are really entirely different to Dravé syndrome, and I will point this out to you, and I think that's really important to understand. How, um, uh, of that, let's just have a look. And these are my disclosures. And the learning outcomes, so number one, describe how the SCM1A prediction tool can aid clinicians in distinguishing genetic epilepsy, febrile seizures plus, and Dravet syndrome phenotypes. And then um, in the second part, uh, recognize the distinction between clinical phenotypes and genotypes associated with SM1A-related epilepsies, and particularly explain the difference between gain and loss of function uh, variants or mutations in SM1A. So I always like to start with a clinical um, scenario, and here we've got Adam. Um, Adam has previously been well, he's four months old. And he presented two days after vaccination at a low-grade fever with a hemiclonic prolonged seizure. So if you come across this in the emergency room, your alarm bells go, it's like, hmm, this is a bit early, this is an unusual presentation, or, and you think. Then three weeks later, he has an admission to the emergency department with fever-induced status epilepticus. So this is where you definitely think, well, could this be Dravet syndrome? and you would want to perform genetic, uh, genetic uh, testing. So at this age, four months old, there's no developmental concerns, um, the neurological examination is normal, um, and you really what you want to know, um, could this child have a diagnosis, or could this child carry an SCM1A variant? Now, what happens is that, yes, you find an SCM1A um, uh, variant, in this child, uh, but remember this child is four months old, and we are now in this dilemma. You think this is a typical phenotype, so with two prolonged seizures, hemiclonic seizures, this really would fit with Dravet syndrome. The child is eventually normal, what do you call it, um, at four months? So this is really difficult. Um, and because we don't, we know about this spectrum of diseases associated with sm one related epilepsies, and Ingo explained that earlier. So we've got the mild end of the spectrum with genetic epilepsy with Febrile Seizures Plus and Febrile Seizures Plus, and on the severe end, we've got Dravet syndrome. And very often for clinicians, it's really challenging to make that call, particularly if the child is very young. Um, after the age of one, when you know there's developmental slowing, cognitive slowing, you're more confident. But early on, this becomes, this is still um, very, very challenging. And this is um, a review by Bill Cattrall and, um, and John Oakley, where they looked at the, and conceptualized how, how do we classify the different variants, the different mutations, and how do they fit actually with the phenotype. And what they proposed was, if you have a mild missense variant, um, then um, this might be associated with a milder phenotype, and if you've got a severe mutation, uh, truncating variant where there's complete abolition of, uh, uh, of, the, of the protein, that you get a severe phenotype. But what we now know is that this is not quite true, and we know that, for example, there's some severe missense variants who are as deleterious as truncating variants. Yeah. So having this distinction between that uh, uh, that's only truncating variants that are most severe. There's also very severe uh, missense variants that are associated uh, with a clear Dravé syndrome phenotype. And there have been a number of groups around the world who've been really looking at how can we tell the difference between Dravé syndrome and other phenotypes quite early on. So this is work from a Japanese group, and they initially looked at um, 
Dravet syndrome phenotypes and non-Dravet phenotypes, and they compared the age at onset uh, of seizures. What you can see is so the Dravet phenotypes are the ones in the darker bars, and the yellow bars are the non-Dravet. And what you see here is that there's sort of this trend that it's the Dravet patients that just present earlier. So it's this early, early onset appear to be important. And then we've got two other groups. Um, uh, in the bottom left, this is uh, Valentina Cetica. They published this in, in, in neurology in 2017, where they really thought that age of onset is quite an early age of onset. It's quite a useful marker for later Drave compared to milder phenotypes. And this is uh, at the top right work by Iris de Lange and a group from, uh, from the Netherlands, and they looked at the age at first afebrile seizure as a clinical predictor of a more severe phenotype. And really their take home message here was that age at first afebrile seizures is an important predictor of, uh, for evolution of seizures into Drave syndrome, um, and that age at first afebrile seizure is an important predictor for Drave syndrome severity. So age at onset clearly seems to be one of these markers that might be of relevance. What we then try to do is, so we have this information from that the uh, genetic variant itself might be important, but also age of onset to build a model um, and to validate this on a large cohort of patients of over, so we collected a cohort from seven countries of over 1,000 patients, so 1,018 SM1A positive patients who had either Dravet syndrome or GAFS plus phenotypes. And we looked here at a model that considers the, uh, what we call the SCM1A genetic score. And what we did here, so we looked at the um, parallel conserva conserva conservation. So we know that um, SCM1A is very similar to um, parallel genes. And we looked at how similar or dissimilar they are. And that gives you some indication whether uh, how significant the variant might be and how well it's conserved. Um, and then we looked at the physical chemical properties of these amino acid substitutions of um, missense variants. Yeah. And then we looked at the age of onset. So we then put this together and the top you can see, so we've got your genetic data and we've got the age of onset data. And then we had a training cohort. These were from five countries, over 700 patients, where we tried to figure out um, how we can actually distinguish the Drave from the GAFS plus phenotypes based on, based on this information. And what we then, once we developed the model and thought this is a good fit for, for these two phenotypes, we then tested that on two blinded populations, okay? So whenever you come up with a diagnostic test, you really have to test that blind, blindfold on another group of patients to see does this actually work. So we tested this twice in two different populations, one population from Australia and one population from Belgium where we did not know the phenotype. We only had the genetic information and data of onset and then we predicted whether our model can actually predict their phenotype. So when we look at, um, first of all, the, uh, when we looked at the training cohorts, so this is where we uh, tested the model. So what you can see here is, so at the top you see the age of onset in the training cohort, and you can see on the x-axis you can see the um, age and months, um, and you can see in purple are the Drave patients, and in gray the GAFS plus patients. So you can see that the Drave patients are further to the left, so they've got an earlier onset. Uh, compared to the, uh, to the guest plus, but you can see there's quite a significant overlap. Yeah, so there's at least a third of patients where there's an overlap. So age of onset alone is, leaves you still with some overlap. At the bottom, you've got the genetic score and um, on, at the, on the x-axis, so if you've got uh, the higher genetic score, uh, the, the more severe we think the, the variant is, and that, we, uh, that goes from zero to about uh, just over 200. And what you can see here as well is that the, so the, in gray, the GAFS plus, they tend to have a milder score, at, uh, uh, um, uh, smaller score, whereas the um, Drave ones with a higher score, but again, there's quite a bit of overlap. And what we then did, so what you perform with any test, you want to do uh, what's called a receiver operating curve, a rock curve analysis, whether you look at um, sensitivity and specificity of that particular um, method. And what you want is really for the ideal test with the highest sensitivity and, 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 and specificity, you want the curve on the left to be towards the uh, upper 
uh, left-hand corner. What we did here is that we didn't only test our model, which is the SCM1A score on onset, age of onset model, we also compared it to, when you just look at age of onset alone, and if you compare it to other genetic scores that are often used by genetic labs, such as um, CAD and Revel, these are prediction tools that are often used um, to predict the uh, pathogenicity of a variant. And we wanted to look, is this is actually, this model that we developed, is it better than what's currently available? What, you, what we can see is that um, our model covered the greatest area and had the greatest accuracy. And on the right-hand side, you can see, um, so the, the, the best model would be a model that follows this diagonally very closely, and you can see that the SCM1A score, an onset model, does that best compared to the others. And then, so now after model development, we then um, tried to apply, the, or we apply this to the two um, populations uh, that were blinded. So the top is the population from Australia with over 200 patients. At the bottom is the population for Belgium with 72 patients. And how this works is that every vertical line is a patient. And uh, on the um, y-axis, you have the probability of Dravet syndrome from zero to 100%. Yeah? And basically, the um, our prediction then um, um, listed all the different patients according to the probability of having Dravet syndrome and the smaller bars to the left and the higher bars and towards the right. And then once we've done that, we uncovered it and then looked at the actual true phenotype. And what you can see is that our model actually discriminates the Dravet from the GAFS plus reasonably well. Yeah, there's still a lot of overlap and I think this is true what we see also in clinic, but I think this gives you, um, particularly what's important here, of course, you can do this the moment you get your genetic diagnosis. So if you have a test result at five months, you know the age of onset, because that's when the patient presented, and you have a genetic test result. So this is, gives you some additional information that actually might be useful in, um, in how you would like to um, counsel the family and um, and, and, and consider treatment approaches. And so we've um, created this um, web tool. So this, you have the, this, this web link. Um, and what you, this works so you have uh, your amino acid position and then you can uh, uh, type in your the amino acid change and the age of onset. And then it gives you a prediction of how likely this particular individual is to have based on this cohort of over 1,000 patients to have either a Drave or a GAFS plus phenotype. Yeah? So this model combines, uh, combines age dot zero onset with a nodal um, SCM1A genetic score and allows, we think, a fairly objective early estimation as to whether that child will develop severe Drave versus GAFS plus. And this can be applied at a time when you have the, your genetic test result available. However, I think what's really important is that this is really an adjunct to clinical assessment, okay? So this tool does not replace your clinical judgment. I think that's really, really important. I think it's something that, um, and so the, the, and the model is designed to be used by trained professionals, including neurologists and geneticists, to aid diagnose of SCM1A-related epilepsies. And the prediction model is intended to complement clinical judgment and not to replace it. I think that's really, really important. And we have to stress that point because I have lots of families who then email me and ask me, oh, Dr. Bunklaus, if, can you tell me about my patient? No, I can't. This is not for you to interpret. This is actually, I would be happy to speak to your neurologist if they would like some guidance, but this is really something that should be done by professionals to understand what the implications of this are. Yeah, I think this is really important. Yeah, so, and that's what, what we serve, tell families that they should really contact their neurologist and geneticist for further advice. Yeah? But I think this is particularly for um, patients um, that present in the first year of life um, and have some idea about where the journey is going to end for this particular child. And um, in terms of making treatment decisions where you're sitting on the fence, should I treat, should I not treat? Um, and, and this is really, we've heard today, this morning, from the new consensus guidelines in terms of starting treatment, which treatment to start, I think this might be helpful. But if it comes to a point where you have to decide about disease-modifying treatments, I think this is something completely different because, of course, 
the risk associated with that potentially we don't know. So this is really something that this that really requires a different discussion. Yeah. But I think this is something that has uh, the potential to inform um, um, uh, clinicians in looking after children with um, Dravé syndrome um, quite early on, earlier than what we currently could. So I'd like to now to move on to the next part of the presentation, which is um, so entirely different. And this is really to look at this newly described, or, or we're describing here, a spectrum of gain of function SCM1A disorders. Yeah, so we now leave Dravet syndrome and talk about a, no, a new disease um, phenotype and patients that have um, uh, these, these, new, uh, these new presentations. Yeah? And this is a collaboration, it's an international collaboration with uh, clinicians from all over the world who um, some of uh, in, the, in the audience um, uh, who contributed to this um, to really describe this in, uh, in, in greater detail. So I think Ingrid gave a very nice introduction um, and I, I would like to, because um, I know that Andrew is here, I think to mention that you know, the first really mutation of SCM1A coding for GEFS Plus, I think that was really important. Um, and then we had um, Peter de Jong's group really applying this to Dravet syndrome. Uh, and these are the two classical loss of function um, diseases. Um, however, we had in 2005, we had this description of SCM1A variants associated with a particular type of migraine, familial hemiplegic migraine. And what we know is that um, these are gain of function mutations that cause uh, a migraine phenotype, uh, which is of course completely different to, um, to the, uh, the epilepsy phenotypes. And just to remind you, when we think about voltage gate, the sodium channel function, so we have sodium channels in the neuronal membrane, and here you can see on the left-hand side, so you've got the pore, um, you've got our in inactivation gate, and we've got the sodium ions on the outside, and at the resting potential, the channel is closed, and then when the channel opens, the sodium ions travel into the um, uh, cell um, uh, into the end of the cell in response to a nerve impulse. Um, the gate opens and then sodium enters the cell. And then this process of inactivation, so for a brief period following activation, the channel does not open in response to new uh, signal. And that's really, really important. So these phases of opening and closing um, and inactivation. And what we understand from Dravé syndrome, guess plus, phenotypes, uh, that these are often associated with a poor dysfunction leading to no or to a reduced sodium current, so to a degree of loss of function. Uh, whereas if we talk uh, about the um, familial hemiplegic migraine variants, they often affect the inactivation gate, which is at the bottom of the channel, leading to failed inactivation leading to increased and persistent and gain of function. So it's a completely different mechanism leading to completely different diseases. Yeah. And we've then had um, Lynette Sudler and uh, Ingrid Schaeffer described um, in 2017 this group of patients with this um, T226M uh, variant. And they were unusual because they are presented, these are children that are presented really, really early. Um, too early for typical Dravet syndrome. So these presented between six and 12 weeks of age, that profound developmental impairment, and they also had a movement disorder, a hyperkinetic movement disorder, which again is really quite unusual um, for Dravet syndrome. And they, they, these, uh, this particular variant has been uh, categorized, uh, uh, characterized by Steve Petrus' group and found to be gain of function. And there's another uh, paper earlier, uh, well, in it, last year, from Kathleen Gorman and Richard Rosch, and they presented a child um, with um, quite a significant regression, hyperkinetic movement disorder, who was mosaic for gain of function SCM1A variant. Um, and then uh, last year, this was an important paper by um, Jabba et al., where they described three children. Um, that had 
a presentation of um, S an SMNA variant and arthrogaposis, or stiffening of the limbs. Two of these children died in utero, one shortly after birth with a lot of seizures. So a completely different presentation what we are used to see in, um, in, in Dravet syndrome. So this is something very different. And so the rationale here was really to um, describe the clinical, genetic, and functional evaluation of affected individuals like this. And the patients were uh, a certain fine international collaborative network using a structured questionnaire and from the literature. And so what we found is that some of these patients have been described in the past, but nobody really knew what they were. And when we actually looked back at the literature, we actually found there are actually quite some descriptions that would fit in this, in this, uh, in this group of patients. And then we performed, that's Massimo Montagazza, performed in this uh, group, um, Hosa Waters Clump uh, experiments uh, to, to characterize these variants and be related then, and then we want to compare these variants uh, and patients with Dravi syndrome, typical Dravi syndrome, and familiar hemiplegic migraine variants and to see uh, how these are different. So we have a cohort of 35 individuals, um, all with early onset developmental, developmental and epileptic encephalopathies, um, with um, 22 heterozygous variants, uh, variants in SM1A. And we also performed literature review where we looked at all the familial hemiplegic migraine variants that have been functionally characterized. And what we found amongst the scored really three distinct different presentations that differ by the age of onset and the presence of arthrogryposis or a movement disorder. So the first and most severe phenotype is that of a neonatal developmental and epileptic encephalopathy with movement disorder and arthrogryposis. We call this endema. So these are patients that uh, present with congenital upper, lower, or multiple limb contractures, so stiffening of joints. And you can see this here in the, uh, in the pictures. Um, um, contributed from our collaborators. And what's really important that these, all these children had neonatal seizures between the day one and three of life. Yeah, you never see this in Dravet syndrome. This is completely different. Yeah, so these are children presenting with tonic seizures and apneas on the first three days of life. They have focal clonic epileptic spasms, eyelid myoclonia, they have generalized tonic clonic seizures and status epilepticus. Um, they often have reflex seizures that are triggered by touch and by noise. And the EEG also shows multifocal discharges as well as migrating patterns. So this is really something, again, unusual. You would not see this in Dravet syndrome typically. And they have normal MRI brain scans. Um, often individuals have non convulsive status of lepticus and continuous spike wave during sleep um, that uh, emerges after the first year of life. And children have this movement disorder within the first two years of life, including these hyperkinetic and choreophore movements. So this is not something that we see in Dravet syndrome. This is really very, very different. Um, and children have profound intellectual disability, often are non-ambulant and non-verbal. So in terms of from the cognitive uh, presentation, much more severe. And these uh, children have been highly drug resistant. However, what we found is that eight out of nine, that's almost 90%, of variant carrot responded to sodium shine blocker treatment, and there was no worsening with um, sodium shine, so with, um, by giving sodium shine blockers. And we call this um, newly recognized phenotype endema. Yeah? Then the second group is that of an early infantile developmental and epileptic encephalopathy uh, and a movement disorder. So the onset here is slightly later, so between two weeks and three months of age. Again, with tonic seizures, apneas, and focal clonic seizures, often triggered by environmental stimuli, but rarely by fever. And there's no arthrogryposis, so these individuals do not have these, the stiffening of the joints. Um, there's a prominent eyelid myoclonia and non convulsive status of lepticus after the first year of life. And you can see this here. Yeah, so the, uh, the, uh, the non commercial status um, in, this, in this boy. Um, children have severe to profound intellectual disability and again, hyperkinetic movement disorder, which is uh, atypical. 
And again, these children are highly drug resistant. However, four out of six um, variants associated with this responded to sodium channel blocker treatment. And again, we, we saw no worsening by giving sodium channel blockers in these, in these patients. So you can see and appreciate that this is a completely different phenotype to Dravet syndrome. Yeah? And I think, and clinically, these patients present so early, if you have these, these early presentations, in combination with an SM1A variant, this is highly suspicious of uh, a gain of function phenotype. And then the third um, um, presentation was, this is one of my patients. So this patient presented at three to four months of age with tonic seizures and generalized tonic-clonic seizures um, that were not triggered by fever and they were never prolonged, again, which is atypical for a Dravi presentation and with a normal uh, MRI brain scan. And this child actually had been commenced on carbamazepine and was seizure-free until we enrolled this patient in this, one of our studies. And as part of our study, we discovered that this patient actually had an SM1A variant. And what we did is, so we stopped the carbamazepine, we started this child in club, on clobazam and valprate, and the child got worse. And then we tried bromide, we tried other treatments until we eventually went back to the sodium channel blockers and this child responded to sodium channel blockers. Yeah? So it's a very, it's a different presentation. Um, and when we, when we looked at this, so this is again, it's a, it's a gain of function variant. Um, so this child has also severe intellectual disability, uh, but it's ambulant without a movement disorder. So you can see there's a whole range of gain of function presentations from really, really severe early onset neonatal presentation with atherosclerosis, movement disorder, and then to children with a profound movement disorders later on. And there's lots of parallels between these three different uh, presentations. So when we now looked at the, uh, taking you back to the cartoon of the sodium channel um, and the distribution of these early onset variants compared to Dravet syndrome variants. So here what you can see is on the left hand side, we are in the, in, the, in the middle, we've got the side view of the protein and what you can see here, these are the early onset DE variants and you can see they're all clustered towards the bottom where the inactivation uh, a gate is, and we compare this to a series of, of Dravet syndrome variants, and what you can see is the Dravet syndrome variants have got a, comp have a different distribution within the protein. Yeah, so they're often around the pore, um, the S4 segments. Um, so they have, you can immediately see this is a, this is a different, uh, uh, they're located in a different position, these, these new phenotypes. And this is now the results from the um, functional analysis. So here you have on the left-hand side the wild type, um, and then you can see the um, action currents displayed here. And then we've had, uh, we characterized four different phenotypes. So the first one was the endema phenotype, um, which is the, um, then the um, uh, ID with movement disorder phenotypes, and the, late, the last one, a familial hemorrhagic migraine phenotype, and what we can see is that if you compare the current density showing that gain of function is the overall effect for all the mutants studied, which is consistent with neuronal hyperexcitability. Um, we were particularly interested in the last two variants because these were variants at exactly the same position, but just with one amino acid change, and one of these patients had um, the profound epilepsy phenotype, and the other patient had the familiar hemorrhagic migraine phenotype. Yeah, so you can see here that even one particular change at the same position to a different amino acid can actually have quite a profound impact on how the actual phenotype uh, presents. And we can see here that, um, uh, that familiar hemorrhagic migraine variants, and all of often have a mixture of gain and function, uh, effects um, that where we found that the epilepsy variants selectively induced a more mild gain of function. Yeah. And then we looked at where are these uh, different gain of function uh, phenotypes located across the, the protein. So here again, the top left, you can see the side view where we have the variants at all at the bottom. And then at the, um, 
um, on the left bottom side with the bottom view, um, and you have in blue the familiar with migraine, then DD, the ID, MD, and the endema. So the endema phenotypes are the most, the most severe phenotypes. What you can see here is on the right hand side, when you look at, if you see a slight clustering, so you can see how the familiar hemorrhagic migraine variants tend to cluster around this hinged lid, whereas the other, the more severe phenotypes, cluster in different areas. Yeah, so clearly, this is just the beginning that we are starting to understand how this actually operates, but there seems to be some location of where these variants are positioned in the, S in the SM1 protein that they cause a particular gain of function or a mixed gain loss of function effects. And so what's really important here is to, the, to, to show the key clinical differences between the SM1A gain and loss of function epilepsies. So um, the gain of function phenotypes are really very, very different from Dravé syndrome. Yeah. So the very early neonatal onset seizures in the first days of life accompanied by arthrogaposis are highly specific for the newly de uh, described endema phenotype. Um, some of these children present with osteopenia, bone fractures, and metabolic acidosis, and that's really not a feature of Dravé syndrome. We don't understand why that actually is the case. Um, then febrile seizures are a hallmark for Dravé syndrome and GAPS+, plus, but not frequently encountered in these gain-of-function phenotypes. So that's clearly a, a clue. And the EG features of non kavarsky status epilepticus and CSWS, they're also not commonly found in Dravé syndrome and an early evidence of profound intellectual disability paired with the emergence of a prominent movement disorder in the first year of life really is highly unusual for Dravé syndrome. So I think having this, having a presentation in the first three months of life with all these features, really you need to think about this is not Dravé syndrome, this is something different. So I would like to conclude so that these scanner function variants are associated with a disease spectrum ranging from the previously undescribed severe uh, neonatal um, endema variants to IDMD and the milder familial hemorrhagic migraine variants. And that gain-of-function disease should be considered early in early onset epilepsies with pathogenic SM1A variants and non Dravé phenotypes. It's really just the, the clinical presentation is really so important for these patients. Um, and recognition of these key presenting features will prevent misdiagnosis and guide treatment choice towards sodium channel blocking therapies. I mean, we've been preaching the community for decades not to use sodium channel, sodium channel blockers in SCM1A. And I think we have to revise this with clinical knowledge that's now emerging. And of course, disease modifying therapy tailored towards loss of function disease isn't contraindicated in gain of function disease. Yeah, so you would need other models of treatment for this. I think what's really important is um, we've had a number of tools recently published that actually help you to estimate the function of a variant. As we all know, it's really difficult to uh, perform functional experiments. Um, I mean, we've um, came across this actually years ago, and Massimo had started this work before the pandemic, and then all his mice has to, had to be sacrificed because of a French government degree. So this, you know, our entire study was delayed by a year <laughs> to, uh, due to all these, um, um, you know, unfortunate circumstances. You know, so it takes, and it takes, I mean, anybody who does lab work knows how long it takes to actually characterize variants um, in, in, in the laboratory. It's a tremendous effort. And I think there's some, well, aid now, so Henrik Heine developed a, a nice tool um, where you have some estimation of where variant might be gain or loss of function. We've pu published earlier this year in Brain also the gene variant effects across sodium channelopathies, prick gain and um, gain of function. It's really a, a library of all um, sodium channel variants ever reported um, with their function, which is a really an, interesting and helpful tool, I think, to get a first glimpse and idea of whether this might be gain or loss of function, but you always, always have to look at the clinic. You know, you cannot just look at the, the two things belong together. You cannot independently look only at the variant with, by, and ignoring the clinical presentation. That's really key in these um, um, new phenotypes. And if you, if, you have a, um, if you think you might have a patient with this particular problem, then uh, reach out to my email address. Uh, we're currently um, working on describing these phenotypes actually in much more detail.
which I think uh, will be really important. And finally, I would like to thank all the patients and families and all the international collaborators um, who really contributed to this. Um, Elaine is here and, and Scott co contributed to this. Then I would like to thank Massimo and Sandrine who did all the functional work, which has been um, really um, important, and Dennis Lalan's team uh, doing some of the um, uh, uh, computational work. And I think for the first part of my talk, really thinking about the prediction models, Dennis and his team have been um, really instrumental to, to do this type of work. And that work was funded by, Driver Syndrome, um, by the Driver Syndrome Foundation. So it's been, I think, a worthwhile effort to, to support um, Dennis and his team uh, for, this, uh, for this work. And then this is uh, our group in, in Glasgow. Um, thank you. Do we have any questions for Dr. Brunkos? Hello, thank you. Thank you, that's such a nice talk. How do you, I'm wondering how you envision the mechanism, right? Because it's not the interneuron hypothesis that we think about with haploid sufficiency, right? So what do you think is going on cellularly? So I think what's very interesting is that, I mean, it's, what we know of the familial hemolytic migraine variants, they present with this mixture of gain and loss of function leading to cortical depression, spreading depression, which is now evidence coming out. For these variants, this is really unusual, particularly if you think that, and what Ingo mentioned earlier in terms of the expression of SCM1A, <laughs> this is really unusual because we didn't think this would be expressed until now. So this, this would only be expressed by, by six months. So how do we get phenotypes that present so early? And this is clearly something we don't understand. We don't know. Why, how can this happen so, so early? And, but what we know is that SCM1A is ubiquitously expressed in CNS. So it, it, it caused, we know that in in Drave patients, actually, it also causes a movement disorder later on. It causes almost, a, it causes a, a rigidity Parkinsonian type movement disorder, where here we find the opposite. We find this hyperkinetic movement disorder, where you think clearly this is, must be due to expression in movement disorder centers in the basal ganglia, where in, in loss of function it causes a Parkinsonian style, whereas in gain of function it causes some um, um, hyperkinetic movement disorder. Yeah, thank, yeah, because SCN1A is in every neuron in the brain, that's absolutely true. Yeah. I'm wondering if you're actually going right to synchrony, right, instead of, and, and which also causes really severe seizures, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, thank you. Do we have any other questions? There's a question, I think, in the front. Oh, okay. Uh, this is regarding therapy. Uh, for example, if you expect to the, um, do a ASO correction and over production of the protein, do you expect to see this in patients? Like, it can correlate or, I mean, I know more testing, but it's just a question about what you expect if there is too much production of the protein. So it, it, will, it, it has to be specified for that particular um, for those particular variants and also for that particular type of function. Yeah, so that, that's really important. Yeah, so there, there are disease-modifying therapies developed for gain-of-function diseases, and that clearly is, could be a treatment avenue in the future, but it's very, very different to the products that we now have for loss-of-function uh, diseases. Yeah, so this is, uh, that, that has to be this very clear distinction, and I think this is why this is really helpful, that at this stage we know about these phenotypes and we know that they, they, will, not quali they will not qualify. And I know that the, the companies who are involved in developing these disease-modifying therapies have certain of the exclusion criteria are a number of variants that uh, are d disqualified the individual for taking part, which I think this work can contribute to in terms of uh, getting, getting some sense of which might be gain-of-function variants. But again, I think this is all driven by the phenotype. I think good phenotyping is really, and the clinical um, phenotyping is really important because that gives you most of the clues, actually. I think the clue is really in the, f in the, in the phenotype and how these children present, and then you, um, you 
match that up with the estimations of what the function will be like. Anyone else? Okay, great. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I have a quick question. Uh, I just want to compare the SCN1A to, it's kind of parallel, but not very similar to MACP2. When there was a MACP2 deletion and the gene therapy was, hopefully it would fix it, we came with a new issue with the MACP2 duplication syndromes and the concerns with that. So do you think if we, if we introduce a gene therapy for the SCN1A, the gain of function, um, the pathogenic variants were going to create a new phenotype in this patient and create a new condition. I know. That's certainly possible. So I think that's why it's important. That's why the preclinical work is so important to to see what effects you actually have if you have these different approaches, and and that's so helpful to learn from other diseases um, and experience and the side effects or other effects that might ensue. So that's why it's important to do all this preclinical work. Wonderful. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooklyn.